Welcome to Dare to Leap, a conversation and community supporting women just like you to gain the freedom, flexibility, and financial security you desire and deserve with CEO and founder of Virtual Expert Training, Kathy Guggenauer. This is Dare to Leap, and now here's the powerhouse tiara-wearing Kathy Guggenauer. Welcome. We have an awesome guest with us today. You are going to love learning from Bonnie Marcus. She has an extensive business background, which includes serving as CEO of a service master company, VP of sales at Medical Staffing Network, and two other national companies in the healthcare and software industries. A popular keynote speaker, Bonnie Marcus is the author of The Politics of Promotion, and her book that just came out, Not Done Yet, How Women Over 50 Regain Their Confidence and Claim Workplace Power. Isn't that an awesome title? I cannot wait to talk with her about this book. Bonnie founded her company, Women's Success Coaching, in 2007 with the mission to empower and inspire women to own their talent and ambition. She is a contributing writer for Forbes and has been published in Chicago Tribune Opinion, Fast Company, Entrepreneur, Business Insider, Thrive Global, Ms. Career Girl, and Washington Business Journal. Also, Ozzy Forge and Medium. Bonnie has also been featured in Inc., Huffington Post, Psychology Today, CIO Magazine, Cranes New York, Diversity MBA, and more. Um, Bonnie, from now on, we're going to say she's been, uh, she writes and has been featured everywhere. (laughs) (laughs) You name it, she's done it. Bonnie received a BA from Connecticut College and an MED from New York University. She is a certified executive coach and has been honored by global gurus as one of the world's top 30 coaches in 2015 through 2020. She's been acknowledged as one of the top 100 keynote speakers in 2008 by Databird Research Journal. Bonnie, you are just amazing and I am honored to have you here as a guest. Welcome. Thank you, Kathy. It's great to be here. Um, And we were just talking, Bonnie lives in Santa Barbara. She's got sunny skies today. And I am here bundled up in my sweatshirt because it is freezing here in Missouri. So I am very, very jealous and trying to get the vibes through Zoom and through our podcast audio here of that amazing weather in Santa Barbara, which I have had the pleasure of enjoying. Well, I have to tell you, um, I'm from the East Coast originally. So I moved to Santa Barbara, California three years ago from the Northeast. And you, ha- you know, the Northeast had this big snowstorm this week. And yes. I was a little jealous and nostalgic. Not that I liked, <laughs> you know, not that I like shoveling two feet of snow in some right. zero weather, but it was, you know, it's so beautiful when it first snows. And uh, so I miss that a little bit. True confession. Yeah. 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 I, I hear you. A snow day. A snow day is fun. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and Gail King, who I call one of my best friends, although she doesn't know it. Um, <laughs> you know, she Gail King, Oprah and me were tight um, in my own mind. Um, mm-hmm. She said something that I totally relate to, which uh, I think you will, too, Bonnie. She said the snow is beautiful for the first 30 minutes. <laughs> And then people walk in it and it gets slushy and you have to shovel it and it is not, yeah, and it's not pretty anymore. So that you could, you could have a little 30 minute pity party and say, oh, I wish I had that, but not in exchange for the the weather you live in every day now. Yeah, it it was, that pity party did not last very long, I have to say. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure. So Bonnie, you have accomplished so much and you continue to accomplish so much. So could you tell us a little bit about your journey to all those huge successes that you had? Because, you know, people out there listening, they're like, I, I can't even relate to being 
you know, top of this and top of that and a VP of this and publishing books and doing all that you've done. So tell us about that journey. Well, people can definitely relate, Kathy, because when you hear my story, you, you'll understand how relatable it is. Um, I, you know, I have an MED in, in education, right? And I was uh, a kindergarten teacher when I got divorced and I had two young a children. Kindergarten teacher. And being oh a okay. kindergarten teacher was wonderful. I mean, I loved it, but it wasn't helping me pay the bills after I was divorced. So I decided I needed like a nine to five job, just a regular nine to five job. Um, I had, my kids were six and eight at the time and you know they certainly needed attention. So I looked in the local paper, you know, at that point in time, the want ads were a good way to, to find jobs. And um, I saw this ad for a medical secretary for a large physician practice. And I, I applied and they called me in for an interview and they quickly told me I was overqualified. I'd get bored and they weren't gonna hire me. And I was like, please hire me. I need a job, you know, I've got these two little kids, but anyway, they didn't hire me. But two weeks later, they did call me and they said they're, they're entering this joint venture with a healthcare management company and about 30 doctors um, to open a cardiac rehab center. And the management company is coming to town from New York and they want to um, interview potential candidates. Are you interested? And I was like, of course. However, I mean, I barely was managing my checkbook at the time. You know, the fact that I would be running a business with like stuff. But I went to the interview and um, I didn't say how qualified I was because I wasn't. At the time, I was also teaching aerobic dancing. So somehow I was so passionate about cardiac fitness. I let them know that. I let them know my dad had a heart attack when he was young. And I knew about the space we, you know, we had to change our whole lifestyle. Anyway, long story short, th there must have been something. So they hired me and they taught me the business. And then in a year and a half, I was running 11 centers like that up and down the East Coast. So that was my entry into business. And so I think what's relatable and what's a great message is that, when doors open for you, don't say no. And yes. that it is possible to learn by doing. And that yes. basically was my whole career. Uh, I never had the intention of making it to the C-suite. I never said, that's what I want. You know, I want to run a company. But when doors opened up and people referred me, you know, I followed through. I wasn't afraid to take the leap. And I learned as I, as I went along and that's pretty much, you know, my career. Um, people will ask me, okay, you've written two books, you write for Forbes, were you trained as a writer? And I, you know, here's the same answer. No, I was not trained as a writer. I um, started blogging when I started my coaching business because I had a website and people said, you need to put up a blog. And again, after a few months, Forbes reached out to me and said, can we publish one of your blogs and would you be a contributing writer? And so that's how I started on Forbes. That was in 2011. Um, but I've had no formal training in writing either. So I that's just amazing. leaped into different things, shall we say. Yeah. So, um, and I will tell you, and I'm sure you've seen this too. There are so many women out there who think, no, I can't go on that job interview because I'm not already an expert at this. Have you experienced that from oh, yeah, other with women? women? Working with women all these years? Yes. I started my business coaching women in 2007. And so we're talking about a lot of women that I've worked with who feel that we need to be 150% qualified before 
or we put ourselves forward for anything. And I mean, I'd say to yeah. myself, what's the worst that can happen? So you get rejected. What's the worst that can happen? You have all the upside of perhaps meeting new people, uh, new opportunities. So that's, I think we need to look at the glass half full. Mm -hmm. So money, how did you have the courage to do that? What gave you the ability to say, I, I know I don't know how to do that, but I'm not going to let them know. And I'm just going to go in there and interview and see if I get it. Well, the thing is, Kathy, I didn't fake it. Right. So um, I was really authentic. And I said, look, I, you know, I didn't go to business school. I, you know, I don't have that training, but I'm smart and I'm willing to learn. And the other thing I remember saying in that initial interview was my whole family is medical. Doctors don't intimidate me at all. So they're just, mm, that's a they're big just one. people like yeah. everybody else. So if I need <laughs> to call doctors in to do their paperwork, I'm okay with that. You know, and that actually might have been what did it and why they gave me the job. I don't know. Yeah. You know, another thing that I hear you saying that you did was you showed them that you really wanted the job that you were passionate about this. And that's one of the things that I teach women is don't be laid back and act like, eh, if I get this, it's okay. If I don't, that's okay. I want to hire people. And I know other people want to hire people who are excited to work with me. Yeah. yeah. And you were excited about it. And eager to learn. I think yes. that's an, another thing. It's like, um, I don't profess to have all the answers but I'm open to learning and I'm curious and, um, you know, you can bet on me. Yeah. And I will bet on somebody like that all day long before I will bet on somebody who has the perfect degree and the perfect experience, but has either a huge ego, um, which most women do not have that issue. That's usually a man's issue, but you know, <laughs> or who's like, you know what? I'm not an expert at this yet. That's fine. You know, mm -hmm. I don't have to unteach you things you don't, you know, that you're doing in the wrong way that I want done in a different way. Maybe not the wrong way. There's not right or wrong, um, but in it, my way. Is to show up as your authentic self. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I will tell you that I've had a lot of people through the years and you probably won't be surprised at this. And anybody looking at this on YouTube won't be surprised at this. I've had a lot of people say, you know, you really need to tone down. You're too much for people. Have you ever heard anything like that? <laughs> I've had clients who have heard that. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And uh, sometimes in a corporate setting, there is a balance between being too much and what is perceived in that culture as executive presence. So yes. it's important to get the feedback and to understand what your culture is all about before you kind of march in and say, here I am, you know. <laughs> well, I will tell you that in my corporate career and I worked for a Fortune 500 company for almost 20 years, and um, I, I walked, I looked the part, okay? Because back then, this was in the, I started in 1977 and quit in 1996. So, you know, the era um, I had to wear, I mean, we couldn't even wear pants. It was uh, dresses or suits. Did you wear nylons, high pants? heels? Did you wear Oh, the hell yeah. 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 I mean, I started my career in, in the mid to late 80s. And we were all about the power suits with the, you know. Oh, yeah. And I'm, Absolutely. I'm short. You know, I'm barely 5'1". So I just oh, felt I like, wow, I had those shoulder pads and I look like I'm 5'7", mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I remember those. Yeah. And, and I would wear a scarf that matched whatever I was wearing. So instead of a tie, like a man wore, I wore my scarf and um, still... Once I got to a certain level, um, I wasn't promoted anymore. And so I went in and asked my boss why. And he said, you laugh and smile too much. 
And until you change that, you're never going to go any further in this company. That was good. And I was, it was, I was 40. I was thankful because before that he had told me it was because I didn't have a master's. So I went and got an MBA and I still wasn't getting promoted. So then when I went in again and said, so I got my master's graduated with honors and I'm still not getting promoted. And he goes, do you want to know the truth? Um, and I literally said, I wanted to know the truth originally. Exactly. <laughs> he goes, you laugh and smile too much. And until you change that, you're never going anywhere. Mm. So I put together my plan and quit. I quit. Yeah. yeah. And uh, it's, imp it's important to put together a plan. You know, uh, when I left corporate America, I mean, I knew I wanted to become a coach. I did all the research about coaching, the good, the, what programs I needed to go to, to get certified, how much it would cost, um, basically what it would take for me to even break even. Um, and I gradually- That's exactly I, what I did. <laughs> I went, um, I changed my status to 1099 started working mm -hmm. part-time as I built up my clients, but it was very strategic. Yeah. 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 And that's a great way to do it. Um, that's exactly what I teach now is, you know, if you need that income, stay at your, I call it a job because, you know, sometimes they're just really yeah. bad places to work. And so you have to spell anything that's that bad. <laughs> so if you, if you need that income, build your other business on the side. It's absolutely doable. Yeah, absolutely doable. And especially if it's a J-O-B, like you're talking about, mm -hmm. um, just use it. Use the income that you have to, to reach whatever your other goals are, starting your own business, right. finding yes. another job. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, you know, uh, I, I'm kind of bashing my old job now, but I will tell you that in the years that I was there until the last five years, much like you're talking about, I learned a ton. I mean, I got a great education. They literally paid for all of my college. I hadn't even gone to any college before I started there. And yeah. I learned, yeah, I learned everything. I had no, no student debt. Um, I had a great education. I had a great 401k socked away and I quit and was able to start my own business from just like you said, from the planning and everything else. Now, when I went into that boss and told him I quit and gave him my resignation letter, you know what he said? He said, you can't quit. And I'm like, I, I know I can. <laughs> I know what the laws are here. And he goes, no, I mean, you can't quit because you're never going to make this kind of money again. And I said, hmm, to myself, I said, yeah, I'll show you. I will yeah. make at least twice this much. And I have actually made, um, in three years, I made twice that much and have gone on to a hundred times that much. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so when you find where you fit, I think it makes a big difference because like you're saying, I didn't fit into the executive realm. I didn't even wear uh, crazy headpieces like I do now um, there, you know, and yet I still didn't fit. So how do you help women, Bonnie, who come to you and they're like, you know what? I'm not happy where I am. What do I do? Yeah. Well, um, first of all, most women, um, I say it's, it's important to have a parallel track, right? So you're unhappy, what are some of the reasons? Are there ways that you can improve your work situation? Are there yes. things under your control? Um, so how can we make it better? Are there opportunities actually to advance here? Yeah. Um, let's take a look at the culture. Let's take a look at what it takes for a woman to get ahead here. Um, let's take a look at your network and do you have a sponsor and do you have allies and champions and everything that I talk about in my first book, The Politics of Promotion. Um, so, I mean, if my clients are willing, that's one avenue to do. And at the same time, then you can look outside and leverage the experience that you have where you're, you're currently. First of all, it's always easier to get a job when you have a job. 
Um, right. And also to to leverage that experience um, for a, a new opportunity, whether that's starting your own business. And we've we've talked about make sure you've got a plan, right? Um, or looking for another job. And when you're looking for another job, I will um, make sure that my clients understand that you you can go from the frying pan into the fire. Oh, yeah. So <laughs> The grass isn't sure always you, greener. Make sure you vet the new company and you do your homework and look how many women are in leadership roles there and mm. what, do they promote from within and um, what is the, the culture there, uh, especially for a woman, especially for an ambitious woman. And of course, what are some, what do you want and expect as um, in terms of support from your employer? And don't be afraid in, in your interviews to make sure that all those questions are answered. Because very often yeah. we, we jump at the first, I mean, women are known for this. We jump at the first yes. job offer. We take- yep the first salary that's put out there. We don't mm-hmm. negotiate and mm-hmm. um, we have to look out for ourselves. We have to put yeah. ourselves first. Money. Do you think um, what, like what percentage would you estimate um, when somebody, when a company makes that first offer, what percentage of the time is there wiggle room to go up? If you know how to negotiate. <sighs> That would be real. That would be a wild ass guess. To be honest. Okay, <laughs> but, you know, if if I'd hate to, I'd hate to say because um, I. Well, have, let's let's you know. let's ask it this way: What's the risk of asking for more? I don't see a risk. Yeah, the answer is no. If you don't ask, right? Yeah, yeah. So you have and, a better chance um, of getting it if you do ask. And it's important to do your homework. It's important to understand what what is the you know the re- the salary range for this position um, mm-hmm. for men and women um, in this mm-hmm. geography in this industry. I mean, you, there's so much information out there that that you can yeah. get. Yeah. Um, and and practice, you know, if it's with a coach or somebody on how to negotiate, there are things that yes. you can do where um, maybe it's not the salary, but maybe you have extra compensation, benefits, vacation time, whatever. Right. Um, exactly. You know, paid time off that you can negotiate in your package. Maybe you can say, okay, I'm willing to take this salary for six months. And if I prove myself by these metrics in six months, I expect to be bumped mm-hmm. X amount. So, I mean, there are different yeah. things that you can use, different tactics, but mm-hmm. I think it shows a lot um, of leadership to, uh, to negotiate on your behalf, if, oh, especially, especially if you do it well. Yes, yes. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. I see it as an up upside, not a downside to that. So do you still work with women who are in the corporate environment to help them? Yeah. Do you still do executive coaching? Oh, yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then do you also work with women um, to transition out of that corporate environment, if, you know, in that parallel path you're talking about? Uh, I do. I do. Yeah. Yeah. Most women who come to me um, are still interested in advancing their careers where they are. I'd have to say that's probably most of, of my client base. Um, mm-hmm. But in, in terms of that parallel track, uh, there are a lot of women who still want to make sure that they are well positioned where they are and mm-hmm. well positioned to get the best possible job that's the next step. Mm, yeah, I love it. I love that. Um, one of the things that I experienced, and again, this is a long time ago, so maybe things have changed now, but 
I think one of the mistakes I made was I went into that corporate environment um, without a degree and as a low level secretary, and then I uh, got promoted within the company and everyone still saw me as that initial secretary. And I never got rid of that stigma. Yeah. So yeah. I think I should have quit and uh, before I quit work with somebody like you to get in the next job where they didn't see me with that stigma. Mm -hmm. What do you think about that? I don't think you needed to quit. I think okay. that, that there are things that you, that one could learn about how to position themselves differently. I think when you understand your value proposition, you understand mm -hmm. how you contribute to the organization, how you're going to mm -hmm. help that organization reach its objectives, mm -hmm. and, and learning how to advocate for yourself, and mm -hmm. building that important network and building influence. Yep. I don't think yep. you need to quit. Yeah, oh, I love that. I love that. Thank you for sharing that. That gives a lot of hope to people out there. So if you're one of those people right now who were like I was, I did not know what I didn't know, Bonnie. Yeah. You know, um, I went in as, you know, I was 19 years old. I had gone to Miss Hickey's business school. I kid you not. That's the name of the business, Miss Hickey's business school um, to learn how to be a secretary. And I was a darn good secretary. <laughs> and I learned fast. Yeah. But um, I did not know how to advocate for myself. That is a really good point. And I've only learned that and learned how to be a leader. i um, having my own business. Yeah. But it's great. you're right. You can learn all of that in the corporate environment if you know how to do it. So anybody listening to this who wants to do that with you, um, how, and we're not wrapping up yet. I know I said we'd wrap up after I asked you this question, but I'm going to ask you this now. And then we're <laughs> going to talk about your new book. Uh -huh. So if anybody wants to talk with you about this, how do they get a hold of you? Well, first of all, you can you can check out my website, which is bonniemarcusleadership.com. And you can email me, bonnie at bonniemarcusleadership.com. And um, I give complimentary sessions. You can sign up for, um, you know, a complimentary session, learn more about my coaching and and connect with me. I'd love to hear from you. Yeah. And I will tell you that um, I'm having a little bit of nostalgia right now because I literally went out looking for somebody like you when th this initially happened to me and I didn't find anyone like you um, back in 1996. And I'm sure there were a few people like you, but um, not, not somebody of your caliber that I could work with because I, it, that would have made a lot of difference. And I really value not what you do. A lot of my clients find me through my book, The Politics of Promotion. Um, yeah, and, um, you know, you can learn about the book on my website too, but that's also on Amazon and everywhere. Okay. It gives women a roadmap for how to navigate and position themselves um, in the workplace. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we will put links to everything she's talking about in our show notes. So you don't have to memorize it or jot it down right now, unless you want to just go to the show notes and you'll be able to see that. So let's shift the topic and talk about your new book. Yeah. Can you show it to us and talk a little bit about why you wrote it and what it's all about? <sighs> so the title not is done yet. Not done yet. With an exclamation. <laughs> That's me. Point. I'm not done yet. <laughs> not done yet. And um, how women over 50 uh, regain their confidence and claim workplace power. And wow. uh, why did I write this book? Um, I had clients who were in their 50s, um, early to late 50s, who were beginning to experience uh, ageism. And I will say gendered ageism, which is yes. big. Um, yes, yes. And they were marginalized. They weren't invited to key meetings. They were subjected to demeaning mm -hmm. comments. Um, mm -hmm. And these are people who were like, you know, general counsels and law firm. I and mean, we're not talking about, oh gosh. you know, uh, people who did not have great credentials and experience. 
And then I started to do research and then I put a, you know, message out that I'd like to on social interview women in this demographic to understand more about their experiences with um, ageism in the workplace. And um, whoa, that was just emotional. I mean, Kathy, mm. it's just, it's incredible to me um, that qualified women are subjected to some of the behavior and comments um, a lot of them are pushed aside, but a lot of them are pushed right out the door. And some of the stories in the, in the book and stories that I heard were one woman, 62, who's in the fashion industry, and she wakes up at three o'clock in the morning and panic attacks that somebody mm -hmm. is going to find out her age. She's going to lose her job. She won't be able to get oh another gosh. one. And we're talking about somebody who's at a VP level, right? And she says, I do Botox and filler and, you know, and I'm just so afraid somebody's going to find out what mm, my that's age is. And then lots of stories about women who have eye lift surgery and this and that, because uh, in, in our society, our appearance matters so much, our age and appearance. And as women, because of the emphasis on our appearance, we face ageism earlier than men. So as oh, yeah. soon as we start to show visible signs of aging, all of a sudden we're viewed as less valuable. We're viewed as mm -hmm. irrelevant. We're, and so mm -hmm. why did I write the book? Because all of this just really pisses me off to tell you the truth. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. And in the it pisses me off too. The introduction to the book is called The Rant because I just let it all out there about how women like you and I have worked for decades and we've sacrificed time with our family to meet our manager's deadlines. And we've done, we played the political dance at work. We've done all this stuff. And now that we have maybe our skin sags or we have some wrinkles, we're pushed to <laughs> or <side>. gray hair. <laughs> like, really? <laughs> um, so the book, the book is actually in three parts. The first part is um, fears and assumptions and all the crap about aging that holds you back. And that's what the stuff that we can control, Kathy, is what kind of beliefs and stereotypes do we hold on to that don't serve us, that hold yes. us back? So for instance, yeah. I'm too old to get promoted. Well, okay. If you believe that, then you need to be aware that you're not going to do what it takes then to get promoted. You're going to pull yourself back. That's right. You're not going to raise your hand. You're not going to advocate for yourself. You're not going to volunteer volunteer for special assignments, all this stuff. So it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Guess what? You're not going to get promoted. People don't even know, you know, you're there anymore. Um, mm -hmm. So that's the first part of the book is identifying some of your own stuff and mm -hmm. realizing that that doesn't serve you. <laughs> really. mm -hmm. You need mm -hmm. to, you need to um, identify how you may be holding yourself back. The second section is um, stop playing small, do what it takes to stay in the game. And those are very mm. practical tips about what you need to do to stay marketable and keep your job. Um, I love that. Declaring your ambition with your manager. I mean, they may assume as you approach 60 and beyond, you're not, you're just biding your time. Uh, yeah. Make a, make a meeting with your manager. Let them know you're still invested and committed to your career. And how can you continue to add value in the next few years? Make a plan. So some of those kinds of tips, um, cultivate oh, your that's really mindset, good. be curious, make sure that you're on the top of your game as far as your skills and be proactive about it. Don't wait until somebody says, oh, you don't know Excel, you know? Well, you're going to lose your job. Um, so be proactive and, and really know what it takes to stay in the game and be marketable. 
So that's second yeah. Second don't be afraid of technology. For example, it, 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 you can learn technology. I mean, that scared me for a long time, and I have an online business. Now I know you don't have to know how to make a computer to use a computer. <laughs> exactly, and you know, one of the one of the ages beliefs we have is that as we age, we're not good at technology, or we and yes, research that shows is. that is not true. By the way. That, uh, and um, I know is not true. I know more about technology now than I ever have. Yeah. And I'm and 63. To, to survive. Yes. And so the, so the, that's full of practical stip, uh, tips and strategies. And the last part of the book is um, be your badass self. Mm. And that's all about connecting with who you are authentically, owning your story. You know, what battles have you fought and won? You know, you're mm -hmm. here now, you're 50 and 60 and 70, whatever. Um, look at all the wisdom, look at all the experience you've had. Um, right. So do what it takes to put yourself first, to stay positive, to be physical and exercise. And mm -hmm. uh, so all those tips are really in, in the last part of the book. And it ends with, you know, moving from a sad ass to a bad ass. Ooh, I love that. I love that phrase. From a sad ass to a badass. Yes. Right. Yeah. Because we can get caught up in our own heads. And I will tell you that, especially if you're out on social media much, there are haters out there. And if I go out there and read much of that um, or listen to other people, um, I like the phrase or the saying, uh, what other people think of me is none of my business because <laughs> there are a lot of people out there who will post stuff like on my own picture saying, whoever this woman is, I don't know why you use this model who looks like a frumpy old lady, um, but what? I wouldn't have used it. Yeah. And I will post and I'll like, well, that frumpy old lady is me and I run this business. And yes, I'm 63 years old and proud of it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I hope you'll join me and be proud of wherever you are in your life because I am. And right. And I dare you to wear feathers in your hair when you're 60. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> 33 for that matter. <laughs> yeah, I exactly. Well, and honestly, I actually thought the picture looked pretty good of me and I liked the outfit I had on. So I'm like, that's frumpy. That's me dressed up. That's me. You on don't want to know me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if you think that's frumpy, you don't want to know me. Um, so that brings me to a question for you. Do you feel like women in the workplace um, have each other's back these days? Or are they, because these were women who were saying this stuff, not men. Um, or are, is there a challenge there? <sighs> I think that women can be supportive of other women. Um, yes, I do and too. You do have the potential to find really trusted colleagues and mentors and advisors and women who can be there for you, not only as a sounding board, but who can, you know, refer you, recommend you for different opportunities. Mm -hmm. um, if, you know, there is a bad player there, uh, then what I'll say is uh, you need to deal with that because that's, you know, that's part of the culture of that environment. And make sure mm -hmm. that you have a really good network of people around that person. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. well, somebody who's going to be at the table when she's a naysayer who's going to say, hey, you know what? Kathy is terrific and I don't think you should discount her. So yeah. it's all about kind of making sure that, that you've got a broad network. Um, and I wish every woman would support every other woman. It's, you know, you need to be smart about it. Yeah. Don't be naive that it's automatically going to happen. Just because uh, you play do it for someone else doesn't mean yes. you're going to get it back. Yeah. Um, and I, uh, what I hear you saying is identify those who could be a challenge and make sure that you surround them with your allies. Yeah, really yeah. smart. 
really smart. And um, I really feel, Bonnie, that more today than ever before, and I don't know if this is just my hope or if it's reality, uh, since I'm not in that corporate world anymore, you can tell me. I know in my industry, this is true, that we women really do support each other more than ever before. For me, it, it is really a mission that I have. And I think it is for you too, Bonnie. That's why you write these amazing books and talk with amazing women that are over 50, because the more we can support each other, the higher we can all grow together and we can change the world. The wealthier women get, the higher pow in power they are. Like Kamala Harris as the VP, I'm just so excited about that now. I mean, that is amazing. We are really making strides yeah. and women supporting each other is what's going to help us all get there. I agree. I agree. Yeah. And we also need men as allies. Yes. And any tips on making that happen? Uh, <laughs> that, you know, that's part of building a, what I call a strategic network. It's identifying the people in your organization or in your industry, you know, if you're in business on your own, um, mm -hmm. people who potentially have influence that you can build strong one on one relationships with. So mm -hmm. how can you help them achieve their objectives? And then mm -hmm. how can they possibly help you? Can they mm -hmm. introduce you yeah. to someone? Can they... Um, just uh, refer you for something, um, mm -hmm. but it, it's a it's a give and take. It's got to be a win win situation. Right, right. You know, I had for years when I first started my business, I had for years avoided um, participating in any groups where there were men because you know of my experience in the corporate world. I thought you know men and I just don't get along with stuff like that, um, and. Then I realized that I was limiting myself. So I purposely found an organization, a mastermind group that was 50% or more men. And everybody was 30 years or about 30 years younger than me on the average. So younger and men. And I was like, I'm going to join that group so that I can get to know some of these men, understand where they're coming from. And like you said, there are going to be some people that I can uh, partner with in there that I can support and they can support me. And I think that was really a big turning point in my business. That's great. That, you know, that takes courage, badass courage, Kathy. <laughs> that is when I got my badass courage. Cause you know what, before then I had been hiding because yes. I look my age you know, I haven't done Botox. I haven't taken as good care of myself as I should. I decided to let my hair go gray. And, and I thought, I'm not going to go anywhere live because if somebody sees me, they're going to be like, oh, this old lady. And then I decided, no, why am I hiding? One of my coaches, thank goodness I had a good coach. She said, stop hiding. People are going to love you. And if they don't screw them. Right. So I joined this group. And it really turned my business around and my courage just skyrocketed. My confidence skyrocketed because the group just embraced me fully. So here's, and, the, you thing. Know, here's the lesson from that, which I love. Yeah. Is that yeah. we have all these stereotypes, number one, about men, about yep. people who are 30, people who are 60. Yep. And yep. until we reach out, and we form one-on-one -on -one relationships, mm -hmm. those stereotypes are going to hold. So people may say, oh, That's yeah, right. she's got gray hair. What does she have to offer? But once they meet you and once they mm -hmm. know you, then they understand yes. the value that you bring and vice versa. Because we have so much to learn from our younger colleagues. Um, oh, yeah. So the lesson there is, to be able to put yourself into a situation like that where you can form these kinds of relationships that, yeah, you're mm -hmm. out of your comfort zone, but the oh, I was. Side, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Kudos to When you. I walked into that, it was a group of 50 people. Um, we met in Austin. And when I walked in and saw, because I didn't really understand how young they all were. <laughs> 
<laughs> and when I walked in and saw them and they're younger than my children. Okay. <laughs> I was like, Ooh, I'm glad I'm confident because I'm going to need it. But I didn't really need it because they embraced me. They all just were like, hey, they didn't act like I was any different at all. You know, I was the one that had that stigma on them, not vice versa. Yeah. 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 So great information. Um, I love both of your books. I think it's amazing. I think people should all work with you. And there's one other thing we need to talk about before I let you go today, and it is your podcast. So can you talk a little bit about your podcast and where people can find it? Yes, I love doing my podcast. Um, The podcast (laughs) is um, Badass Women at Any Age. And each week I interview women who have had... Well, they, they talk about their journey, about what they've overcome and what they've learned about themselves and how that has informed the work that they do today. Um, and what I love about that, you know, we started this and you said something about being relatable, but I believe that's so important too, because we look at women who have these you know, we look at their title and their mad success and we think, oh, God, mm-hmm. but everybody has their story of oh, yeah. how they have achieved their success, what they needed to do to overcome it. And that is so inspiring. And so it's my hope that women who may be stuck or playing small will be inspired by some of the stories to step into their badass self. So Mm -hmm. um, my podcast is on Apple and wherever you listen to podcasts and and, um, it airs every Tuesday. I do it weekly. And I have met some amazing women by doing this. And I, you know, I'm so grateful for the opportunity. It's fun. Yeah. And you're fun. So I know your podcast is going to be fun and you are so full of great information and great advice. Um, Before I let you go today, I want to go back to one thing, which no, actually two things you just mentioned playing small again. So do I'm guessing that either or both of your books talk about how to stop playing small um, or your podcast does. Because I see this as a massive problem for a lot of women. Men, they don't seem to have that problem. They play big, full out, sometimes to the point where you're like, really, I know you and you ain't all that. But they, (laughs) it doesn't matter. And I'm proud of them for still playing full out. But women, even when they do have all that, they don't play full out. They still stay small. So do either of your books? Yeah, so actually both books address it. (laughs) Good. Um, in the first book, I talk about how your limiting beliefs may hold you back mm, uh, yes. um, and that we really need to challenge it. And, uh, you know, as I talked about earlier, there's some things that are within your control and there's some things that aren't. So what can you do to stop playing small and dismiss a lot of these beliefs that are holding you back, recognize it and, 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 and work at not giving them so much energy. I mean, you're never going to get rid of all the stuff, but how much energy you place on it is, is really important. Um, and certainly in the second book, um, because I think as we age, our tendency may be to play smaller. So there, you know, there's a whole section in there. And actually, if you go to my website on the coaching tab, there will be Stop playing small, like right there on my coaching page. <laughs> oh, I love it. I'm going there when we're done here today. Because I find that women have the tendency to do it. And at least for those women who recognize that they need to step it up and that mm-hmm. maybe there's a pattern in their career, you know, mm-hmm. where they're playing small and they're overlooked and they're done with it. You know, mm-hmm. those are my clients, you know? <laughs> yeah. And, and in hindsight, I can definitely tell you, I was playing small. I bought into my own 
uh, defeatist attitude of I'll never be bigger and better. And that's just where I am. And I'm so, uh, I, I'm not going to say I regret that because I'm super happy where I am now. And, you know, if I hadn't done what I did, I wouldn't be where I am now. Yeah. Um, I also find a lot of women think of things like, oh my gosh, I don't want to start over. So Bonnie, all those different careers that you've had, all the different books that you've written, um, you never started over. No. You've no. always been growing and growing and growing from that foundation that you built on and on and on. So do you hear that very often from women saying, oh, I don't want to start over? Well, what I'm hearing lately is I'm too old to start over. And that's just yes. nonsense. <laughs> nonsense. Because yeah. we have to look at our whole journey and we have to look at everything, all that knowledge we've accumulated, all those lessons we've learned, mm -hmm. all that wisdom that we have now. And maybe it's time that we leverage that and we think about a new yeah. start by being able to, um, you know, really ground ourselves in all that yeah. talent and wisdom that we have. Because right. we're not done I yet, mean, Kathy. <laughs> no, because look at the president of the United States. How old is he? Right. He ain't too old to be the president. You are not too old to start over no matter what age you are. Not start over. Let me switch that. You are not too old to do whatever it is you want to do at whatever age it is. If you're still alive and breathing and you want to do something, do it. Yeah. You're the your, only person holding your you back. Your ambition should not be tied to your birthday. Your chronological. Well, I love way. that. I love that. I love that so much. Yeah. Um, because I was thinking um, before Biden ran, I literally was thinking mm, at 70, I might want to start slowing down. And then he ran and I thought, oh, hell no. If he ain't slowing down, I ain't slowing down. <laughs> well, look at Nancy Pelosi. Hello. Yes. That's another great that's example. Amazing. Regardless of what you she think is. politically. That oh, I don't care about the politics. Powerful. She is, a, she is a badass. <laughs> don't mess yeah. with her. Yeah. No, that's right. Um. So yeah, and and I love role models like that. I'm so glad we have them. Yeah. So the last thing I want to ask you about is a little bit of a different topic, and um, I, I would just like your opinion on this, which is. Now that we've, we're going through COVID and things have changed with the workforce, a lot of remote work, a lot of virtual work, do you see any trends in changes in the workplace as a result of that? It's definitely harder when you're working on Zoom all day and you're not passing people in the hallway or in meetings physically where you can pick up on body language and stuff. It's, a, it's more of a challenge to try to figure out where people are at, what they're thinking. Um, it's much more challenging to get visibility with key people and influencers. So it's, it, I think it's easy, especially because we're so burdened with, we got kids, we've got a spouse, a partner, we've got you know, all this stuff, everybody's at home. Um, we've got an old dog like yours who can't make it up. <laughs> uh, I mean, we've got like all this stuff and it's easy to say, well, you know, uh, I, maybe I didn't get to raise my hand in that meeting, but you know, it's, it's okay. Cause a lot of people didn't do it. And rather than understanding that we do have some control, we can can create more visibility. We can reach out to keep people and have one-on-one -on -one meetings, even if it's not live. I mean, if it's not, you know, in person. In person. Um, right. And we yeah. need to, um, we need to realize that if we're falling off the radar, it's important to kind of turn it around. Yeah. You know, some of the things that I see, Bonnie, um, is, people not having their video on when they're on zoom. Yeah. What's with that? Um, because it, it, I know turn your video on, be prepared. Even if it's just from the waist up, 
unless yeah, you're going to stand up and know. if you think you might <laughs> you don't want to know what i have on today from the waist down <laughs> you know um it's a whole new wardrobe it's, thing but um yeah yeah speak I, up I, I'm don't on be Zoom quiet all day long and believe me i don't I don't like looking at myself on Zoom all day long. I just I can't stand it. <laughs> you look beautiful. And when I do my podcast, I turn my camera off. I don't, you know, I don't do what you do because I just, it distracts me and I don't like looking at myself. <laughs> but so, in meetings, have yeah, that video on. In meetings, definitely. speak You're up. You're missing out on an speak. opportunity. Speak up. Don't just sit there quietly because you can and if you need five minutes with somebody, uh, I, you know, grab them. Uh, hey, do you have five minutes at the end of this? Yeah, let's just stay on Zoom and, and keep chat. connected. I would say try to keep notes of who said what in the meeting. And then afterwards, send somebody uh, a note, send them an email and say, that was a great point you brought up in that meeting. Or um, I, I heard that. what you said about this. Here's an article on that that you might be interested in. Just keep yes. visible, keep these keep these conversations going stay top of mind yes yes yeah yeah um and right after this for example i have a monthly meeting that i have with a male counterpart just like you were talking about we meet monthly because we want to really support each other. And we know in this era, in this busy time of everybody being busy, months can go by and we don't connect. So even if we don't have anything we definitely need to talk about, we have this set time that we get together to say, hey, what's up with you? Here's what's up with my business. How can we support each other? And it has really um, increased our uh, it improved our business relationship and we are brainstorming new ideas. I mean, I can't tell you uh, how beneficial that one thing has been. Yeah. Oh. Well, Bonnie, I could talk to you all day long. I love you. Uh, I'm going to come and well, visit you, you know, in Santa Barbara. Come to Santa Barbara. <laughs> Cause I'm not coming am to going Missouri. To I got news for you. Oh, hell no. Hell no. No, no. I don't want you to come here because I want to have a business reason to come to Santa Barbara. <laughs> you got um, it. And yeah. And um, both of your books get, get Barbara's, oh, Barbara, get Bonnie's books. I don't know why I just said Barbara, get Bonnie's. Oh, cause it's Santa Barbara. Right. Get Bonnie's books. <laughs> get it's Bonnie's Santa books. Bonnie, Santa Bonnie. <laughs> get, um, watch, listen to her podcast contact her on her website, email her. All of those links will be in our show notes. Bonnie, thank you so much for spending this time with us today. Thank you, Kathy. It really has been fun. Thank you for listening to Dare to Leap. Say hello and access additional resources at virtualexperttraining.com. There you'll be able to connect with Kathy to share your feedback and join her community. Join us again soon on Dare to Leap. Until then. Mm-hmm.